Socialism, a movement that seeks to free people from the compulsion of capitalist competition as it manifests through state, class and empire. This, to my mind, also implies a form of social liberty where out from beneath the yoke of capitalism, people come to be more free to explore and express their individual liberty in any way they see fit. The form of this statement might be attributed to the eminently bourgeois John Stuart Mill, whose harm principle stated that the only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way, so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it. In other words, people should be free to explore and express their individual liberty in any way they see fit as long as it doesn't impinge on the ability of others to do the same. While this does seem similar to what I just said about socialism, I would argue that the two statements are separated by a gulf in the quality of their meaning. Historically situated, interpreted, developed and practiced, Mill's principle tends to ignore the context of each individual and their different capacities to act in terms of their own good in their own way. Ignoring the context seems symptomatic of the bourgeois society that must have emerged in the towns and growing cities of a fading feudal Europe. Their movement for emancipation was defined as an individual liberty felt to be constrained by the aristocracy and their medieval institutions. This emancipation must also have been marked from the peasants' way of life who, while still largely dependent on the land, were increasingly moving to those towns and cities in search of wage labour as the land increasingly came under the capitalist mode of production. The bourgeoisie, becoming educated and wealthy, would have been practising a novel independence in stark contrast to the growing body of urban labourers, displaced from their land and relying on the numbers for survival as they sought work at the factories. We can imagine this stark contrast between dependence and independence being an ideal bed for the seeds of class disdain to take root, where an irrational hatred for other that we see displayed so often today would have led to the dismissal of the background context and an uncaring assumption that the trappings of bourgeois life was equally open to all who were interested. It may have been in this context that bourgeois liberalism is instituted, a context that ignores the environmental or atmospheric conditions that support or constrain the individual's ability to act. This perspective assumes a total ability on the individual and would argue one's given condition as a matter of choice rather than circumstance. As capitalism drove their burgeoning individualism against the aristocracy, culminating in so much revolution in the name of democracy, that democracy would have fused with that revolutionary capitalism through which individual liberty was realised, forming the bourgeois ideology and an extremely particular vision of the free human subject and how it might be attained. Regarding the peasants then, this fused vision of the human subject as its articulation is played out in real time simply would not have included those who looked otherwise to the triumphant, wealthy and distinguished bourgeois capitalist liberal subject. You see this perspective clearly through the ages. John Locke expresses it in his theory of property outlined in the mid-17th century where, while on one hand he states that God gave all land to all men equally, man only has a right to that land if he intends to continuously improve its productive capacity, or in other words, if he does a capitalism on it. Reading Marx's Capital, we come across many examples of industrialists from the mid-19th century casting the lives of their labour in such meagre light when questioning the point in extending them any free time from the factories at all. And 19th century psychologists such as Hippolyte Taine and Gustave Le Bon express this disdain for those who fail to practice the same distinct humanity as the bourgeois individual in describing crowds as pathologically irrational, prone to mental contagion, and being several rungs lower on the ladder of civilization. The aristocracy, they said, was less prone to forming the crowd than the popular classes, and those unable to extricate themselves so distinctly were as demoralising to society as drunkards and women. For Le Bon, crowds were a synonym for sections of society unable to perform the independence afforded by wealth, sections of society that looked like those peasants in European towns a century or two before. Basically, he was targeting the poor. In the 20th century, then, this view underpinned the rise of neoliberalism to power. The ideology was fashioned in the 30s by the likes of Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, who espoused a possessive individualism. This was the view that the capacity to act and determine one's own future lies solely within the individual, who therefore takes from, and owes nothing to, society. This view is exemplified again in Samuel Huntington's 1975 paper, The Crisis of Democracy, in which he argued that society was becoming ungovernable due to an overbearing democracy suffocating the possibility of liberty. This was to say, political groups lacking financial means and therefore possessing no other recourse but to act collectively were impinging too heavily on the freedom of the wealthy to perform their bourgeois liberties. The paper featured at a meeting of the Trilateral Commission in 1976, a meeting at which Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were present. Both subsequently came to power in the US and UK, where they instituted this disdainful perspective and endeavoured successfully to stamp out the sense of social solidarity that prevailed in the post-war period. Social solidarity was the common sense recognition that interventions could attenuate social conditions to support vulnerabilities. This wasn't an anti-capitalist common sense by any means, but the commonly held recognition that capitalism could be regulated to improve the lives of the working class. 
It was the normative foundation for the social welfare state which, with Thatcher's declaration that there was no such thing as society, has since collapsed, and society, which of course does exist, has returned to a foundational perspective in interpreting Mill's harm principle. But in believing that there is no society, then no atmospheric or ambient factors determine the agency of the individual. Under this perspective, not only are groups who act collectively doing so by pure personal choice rather than necessity, they are also antithetical to liberalism and to be disdained of, and when the opportunity arises, suppressed. Under this belief, the action of each unitary individual casts only a small net in terms of potentially impacting other people. Their relative standing in society, the power they do or do not wield, is ignored. This is an equality that treats people without consideration of their context or background. But in a society where a few are born with so much, and most with so little, the actions of a poor individual truly does cast a small net, whereas the actions of individuals who happen to be CEOs of corporations that see more economic activity than most countries, their individual actions and decisions hold enormous consequences for millions of people, if not the entire planet. In their position, wielding that degree of power yet distanced from its impact, it is impossible to know the freedom they deprive others of, or how they impede the efforts to obtain it. Yet this is supposedly the only freedom which deserves the name, pursuing our own good in our own way, and such a position is the culmination of campaigning, lobbying, bribing and manipulating in that freedom's name, the name of liberalism and the liberty to act as one pleases. What is more, in terms of the analysis of society, power and history that liberalism lends itself to, it's impossible to even begin making assessments of the deprivation and impediments such a position represents to so many others. Mill would surely excuse the CEO. Such deprivation and impediment may conceivably exist, but the actions of the CEO do not amount to an attempt to cause such, and this is the kernel of the freedom of liberalism. If we can't conceive of it, we can hardly legislate for it, and if we're all born with that which determines our capacity to act, then the most efficient social order saving the individual from the effort of such extra natural consideration is that we should use those personal resources to care for ourselves and endeavour to buffer our own selves from the possibility of the actions of others accidentally impeding our freedom or our ability to attain or exercise it. Between Mill and the CEO here, there's a tacit agreement linked to their particular view of the individual, their dismissal of atmospheric factors in determining the agency of individuals, and the conditions under which liberty ought to be extended to individuals that regards how society ought to deal with vulnerability. An extreme application of the logic of possessive individualism would leave an infant to fend for itself despite its vulnerability, as it has been born with the attributes it needs. Ambient factors such as parental care and education play no part in its survival and development, according to this view. But of course, no one disputes on a basic level that a child is too vulnerable to function independently in society without care and guardianship. So society tends to care for children due to their innate vulnerabilities. However, the logic is applied to adults and ignores the ambient factors that cause vulnerability in relation to other relative social positions, even when it comes to their ability to care for their children. If you're poor, your capacity to carry out that care is determined by your character. Adversely, if we extended the logic of caring for the vulnerable to its extreme, we would have a ridiculously stifled society where no one was free to act for the bubble wrap tightly enveloping them. Totalising any logic tends to render society in an absurd situation. Yet we are in a situation today where capitalist competition compels the advocacy of market logic dogma that veers us dangerously close to the absurd situation whereby adults are offered little support to care for their vulnerable children, or where care for the elderly and infirmed rests on a personal rather than social responsibility. Private healthcare represents precisely this absurd totalising extremism, and politics is something that happens in between these two points. And while I don't believe there exists a political movement that pursues the total care position, as the left tends to represent a point between these two extremes, the right and its pursuit of a capitalism free from intervention represents a push towards that totalitarian extreme. The term left wing comes from those on the left side of the French parliament around the time of their bourgeois revolution who represented commoners against the aristocracy. Since then, left-wing capitalists in the early 19th century pursued improvements for the lives of industrial workers and generally, the term alludes to a segment of the capitalist establishment that seeks to counter somewhat the brutality of that right-wing extreme of possessive individualism. It was not until Karl Marx that a re-articulation of the term left-wing occurred, lifting it from its bourgeois capitalist limitations. Marx critiqued the political economy of capitalism as a whole, articulating a leftism that democratised the process of transition from capitalism to socialism by asserting that it must be the working class and not the bourgeoisie that determined the nature of that transition, while that transition was not merely to seek improved conditions for industrial workers, but a fundamental change in the relationship between workers and the means of production. 
Returning to Mill's harm principle then, it's clear that it expresses a very distinct historical sense of personal freedom. Centering on the individual in the way it has, it excuses that individual from consideration of others. If the individual already possesses all it needs to survive and succeed in the world, then such a consideration for others is on an essential level an unnecessary burden. Of course, an individual can be moved by the plight of those who choose not to assemble and orient their faculties and resources towards success and choose themselves to act and become philanthropists, as did the early bourgeois left wing and as many do today. But on that essential level, beyond philanthropy, any general moral or governmental imposition to reckon with that burden is seen as an illiberal intervention. Left-wing capitalists operate within that philosophic framework, choosing to take on that burden but not seeking to fundamentally alter society and break from that framework, placing that burden on others. However, if we are to acknowledge instead of ignore the material impositions that such a position implies for individuals in our society, by recognising that most individuals lack any choice that might deliver them any great distance from their starting point in life, recognising the effects of family, status, education and wealth among others in determining our personal endpoints, Mill's harm principle is turned on its head. Once we recognise these ambient or social factors and how they possess a tendency to impact a wide range of people in society, we can articulate groupings of people such as, for instance, class. The struggle the bourgeoisie undertook in emerging from feudal Europe would have centred on the notion of the individual, warping the possibilities of what the term might mean, manifesting somewhat understandably in a fetish for its sanctity, an overdetermination or overemphasis that peasants coming to towns in search of wage labour must have simply seemed uninterested in. In moving away from this individuated perspective, and in recognising a fundamental material imposition generated by the free operation of those bourgeois individuals, we can offer an alternative for how those peasants might have seemed. This imposition manifested in a division of labour that developed from the adoption of capitalism and the capitalist mode of production. After being dispossessed of their access to land and the means of production through the emerging market competition and leaseholding, this emergent mode of production subjugated those peasant individuals to the requirement of selling that which they were left with, their labour. This was the only way they could once again gain access to the means of production, but under the enhanced terms of the capitalist rather than the feudal lord. And in this emergent division of labour, their relationship to the means of production so thoroughly altered, they possessed a singular characteristic, that of a class a class impoverished in relation to another class that had possessed the means of production exclusively and were benefiting immensely from that. So examining Mill's harm principle in terms not of possessive individualism, but in terms of class, reveals the need for an interpretation alternative to our normative one. The principle again, the only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it. In terms of a class perspective, of one class controlling the means of production, permitting the other class access to it for an exorbitant fee, theoretically, the capitalist class, through expertly marshalling resources, creates wealth that he then shares with the other class. The material reality, however, is that that exorbitant fee, collected by the capitalist through surplus labour his employees perform for him, accumulates and over time the disparity between the classes grows, leading to a situation of absolute dominance of the few over the many. In the competition for the accumulation of the surplus wealth, there are winners and losers among the capitalist class too. Where once there was a general field of capitalist enterprise and free competition, this process tends invariably towards a centralisation, toward monopoly, colonialism, and then when competition intensifies even further, towards open conflict, which will always pit the working class at the front. How then do we reconcile bourgeois capitalism with bourgeois liberalism and Mill's harm principle? By pursuing their own good their own way, each capitalist, while no doubt trying their best not to deprive others from their good or impeding their efforts to obtain it, through the logic of capitalist market competition, they are eventually compelled to send millions to the slaughter. Even before we get to this stage though, in the generation and accumulation of surplus wealth by the capitalist class, the position of the working class is continually undermined. The access to material wealth or resources constantly being pushed further away and with it the opportunity to pursue one's own good. Capitalism deprives us of this and impedes our effort to obtain it. The personal freedom of some to pursue their good through capitalist enterprise objectively deprives and impedes others from doing the same when we recognise that it institutes a class in society determined by the relationship to the means of production. The ability of the individual to flourish, no doubt the aim of Mill's harm principle, practiced within a context of possessive individualism and capitalism, is self-undermining and unable to result in such liberty. Instead, it consigns humanity to a constant and violent struggle with itself. So how might the principle be re-articulated so that the individual might actually flourish? 
we could start by recognizing that possessive individualism is a patently incorrect position that people's fortunes are determined as much if not more by their social context as by their character and personal attributes and that capitalism is a compulsion binding humanity to constant struggle rather than any form of emancipation if we wish to be free individuals we should recognize firstly that we simply cannot be so under the capitalist mode of production which sidelines the vast majority of society from the axis of the means of production pushing them continuously away from the material wealth or security required to perform human individuality while locking the minority with control over it into constant and often violent struggle among themselves secondly then we should articulate our social obligations in a way that transcends possessive individualism Regarding capitalism class relations to the means of production, that's for another conversation, or preferably, an actual revolution that breaks this relationship. But regarding possessive individualism, it should be recognised that it is a nonsense to ignore people's circumstances in analysing their vulnerabilities, and that our only hope to flourish as individuals in a truly universal sense rather than in terms of one class over another depends on our attitude towards one another and in recognising the need to identify and attenuate for vulnerability. It's not to merely extend such considerations to others, but that they in turn would extend them to us. Neither is this a moral nor ideational consideration, but one based on the material necessity for a socialist mode of production, whereby each individual works according to their ability. What is then taken for consumption from production, and what is essentially an act of solidarity and in consideration of possible vulnerabilities, and thereby antithetical to bourgeois liberalism, is determined by human need, not, as per the capitalist mode of production, endeavour or merit. Decoupling production and consumption in this way implies a recognition for a wider social obligation than is articulated through possessive individualism. It forms the basis for a human material context wherein individuals, once this obligation is met, may be free to explore and express ideationally their individuality, free from a normative imposition to conform to any social uniformity. This obligation is determined by the personal recognition that to consume as an individual, collective production is necessary. So crucially, we must also be free from the needs to compete continuously in the expansion of capital and commodify and sell one's own labour in order to survive whatsoever. In this latter set of freedoms, the former is fundamentally enhanced, freeing people from resource competitions and the antagonisms between particular working class positions that are proliferating today. In this way, emancipating society from capitalism frees people from the compulsion of capitalist competition that manifests through state, class and empire. And in this, it is implied that a form of social liberty is achieved whereby people are free to explore and express their individual liberty in any way they see fit, which is sort of like Mill's harm principle, but in a thoroughly enhanced sense where, while we are free to pursue our own good in our own way, we may only do so once that common good is seen to and our social obligations to one another are met. A consideration that seeks not to deprive or impede anyone else's ability to also do so, but to socialise the work we do today, and more importantly, putting a halt to the upward distribution of wealth away from its producers, thoroughly reducing the harm committed by capitalism to the vast majority of people on this planet.